Hi, everyone. My co-host today, Barry Toon, joins me with Nick Bauer, who is a sergeant with the Seattle Police Department with over 28 years of tenure, including tours in patrol, precinct detectives, major crime task force, federal task force assignments, and undercover operations. He shares his mental health journey with us today and the challenge he continues to take on helping fellow first responders navigate careers that put them on the front line of care and service. For who? For us. Thanks for joining us. I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily. Oh, I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sunanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years, and we have amazing co-hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well-being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this. Intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. After all we promised we be cordial. Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Barry, as always, thank you for uh, being my partner in crime. And that is a pun intended since we're talking to someone who's on the police force. (laughs) So Nick, you've, you know, you've got a storied career. I, I read as much as I could to introduce you and it's, you know, longer than my arm. How do you feel at this point in your career when, you know, do you ever look back and go, I can't believe all the things that, that I've done and that I've been involved in and that I'm still standing. Uh, You know, that, that thought has occurred to me from time to time. Yes. A lot of the experiences, um, I I think I do a fairly good job of washing out of my memory, at least immediate memory. Uh, Right. And so it really takes someone to maybe remind me, you know, Hey, you remember that time when it's like, Oh yeah, gee, that was pretty crazy. But I, I guess I, I, thankfully tend to dwell on the, on the present more than I do, um, you know, in past experiences. Well, you have to, I mean, and part of that is when you've dealt with trauma, you know, on the job trauma and other people's trauma, because you're a first responder, um, that can kind of mess with your memory as well, you know, because those moments become so crystallized. Would you say that's true sure. for you too? Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, not to make light of the fact that I, I've had some, some fairly rough patches um, as a result of my, you know, um, work and career. So I think that I've been quite lucky in, um, you know, experiencing those rough patches, very rough, desperate, uh, some would argue. And then thankfully being able to find a way to, you know, address those issues, surmount those challenges and get back to not just surviving, but actually uh, aspiring to to thrive in my life. Um, right. And I think that's, it's it's kind of a strange thing. Like I tell some people, I, I would never want to go through through some of the experiences that I've gone through in this, in this, on this job. But at the same time, I'm also quite grateful because it's, it's made me the person I am today, especially you know, since I've had the benefit and been lucky enough to be able to surmount the, you know, the, the, uh, the trauma that's, that's felt in my system. So it's kind of a weird uh, conundrum, right? You know, you, you never want to go through that again, but you also have to find some gratitude in, in, uh, in you know, being the person that I am today and, and, and being as helpful as I am. I try to be every day with uh, fellow first responders. Absolutely. I mean, there's a humility in, in your voice when you're talking about this and, 
you know, every first responder that I've spoken to, and I'm sure there are others that aren't this way, <laughs> usually they're the younger ones where you go, oh, you'll learn about that humility. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I've had plenty of uh, lessons in uh, how to be humble, for sure. Yeah. What What made you turn towards, you know, wanting to take on something like a mental health initiative? Well, um, and I think my well, I'll say my journey probably started back in, in 92 when I, you know, was first a young cop, even though I didn't know it until about 2005-ish. Um, in late 2004, I was in a shootout that sort of just, um, I don't know, it wasn't so much the shootout or you know, the, the situation um, as it was, it seemed like my whole world kind of came crashing down all of a sudden. And of course, I wanted to blame that one incident what I later learned through hours of counseling and, and uh, you know, um, reading and, and, and efforts to, to get back on top of myself was that it was a, it was, it was a culmination of all these experiences that had, um, you know, stored in my system. And I think that event just sort of was the, you know, just the straw that, that, that broke the camel's back. Right. So, um, so it's, you know, um, and, and, and through that experience, once I got better, and, and I was at a very desperate spot. Uh, I would, you know, I'll just be very open. Uh, I was very Good. close yeah, to starting my gun right. at, at, at one point, um, which I would call the, you know, the rock bottom. And once I started getting better, it took a couple of years really to get feeling solid again, I'll say. I, I became very worried that if someone didn't have the constitution that I have, and or that they weren't as, as you know, some would argue as stubborn as I, uh, you know, to jealously pursue getting to a better place, it might cost them their life. And that, that became a very big concern of mine. And so I guess step one was, was going to one of my chiefs and, and talking to them, um, complaining that they didn't really have a very good peer support system for officers who had just been in shootings. So he said, well, congratulations. You just volunteered yourself to improve that system. Uh -huh. like, wow, I should really probably should have thought that one through a little better. But uh, uh, <laughs> so I started this, uh, what they call the lethal force response team. Um, and, and that's that's in effect in policy to this day with Seattle police. And, and the basic is that uh, an officer who's been involved in a shooting and who has been through some level of, of, of peer support training is actually uh, dispatched just like CSI and homicide to the scene uh, purely to look out for the emotional needs of the officer involved in the shooting and their family. So Fantastic. it's been a very effective program. We can just kind of sit with them. Sometimes it's just, you know, getting them water, food, notifying, you know, family, working, um, working out logistics, things like that. But it's, it's been a pretty useful program. I think it was step one in really developing a solid, robust peer support system with Seattle Police. That's amazing because you're on the job and you're doing this and you know that there are people that there that are just for you. Yes, it's 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 rare. Um, it, not so much rare, not so rare anymore, but it's it's uh, it was actually uh, very rare back in, you know, 2004, 2005. And, you know, the interesting thing about my experience, you know, now having been on both sides, actually three sides of an officer involved shooting as an example, one is the shooter, one is the investigator, and uh, three is, third one is uh, as a peer supporting the person's, uh, you know, emotional, emotional condition. You know, it's, uh, it's several times officers have, we give them a packet after we, or just before we leave them for that night after the shooting. Several times, officers, I've called them a couple of days later to check in with them and ask them, hey, how are you doing? And they're, they're the common answer, common answer is, you know, um, I've got this packet and it's got your phone number on it, but I have no idea where I got it. Right, uh, exactly. Which illustrates that they're operating on some, you know, some kind of planetary module that, you know, they're, they're just floating around. Um, but they have their, their system is so jacked up that they have no recollection of, of, of the course of events after this, you know, traumatic incident. And, you know, and that, I think if they know that someone was looking out for them, even when they don't have a recollection of where they were, you know, what they were doing, 
I, I think it, it provides some level of initial comfort for them and sets a stage for them to be open to if they're having problems sleeping, if they're showing other symptoms, being open to getting some, you know, some meaningful help. I want to follow up on the, the, the peer support programs. You, you've created some peer support programs. I happen to know you've been involved in mentoring a lot of other departments around the country and either creating their peer support programs or improving their peer support programs. Uh, for listeners that uh, are involved or have some influence in their departments with those programs, what are the key ingredients for a good peer support program or wellness program within a department? Um, you know, and it's it's sort of a fluid thing, but I think the, the basic ele primary elements, uh, one is to have uh, support of command. Uh, if, if command... Uh, doesn't support a peer support effort. It's, it's pretty much done before it even gets started. And it, it, it's not extraordinarily expensive. Some of the initial train ups are, you know, they're an expenditure, but it's not a, a huge, you know, cost basis. Um, and then once, once you have, you've established that the command supports the effort, I think the next big step is selecting the right personnel. And I'll, I'll be honest and frank, you know, there are some, um, some people who want to be on a peer support team or a peer support team member um, to pad their resume. Uh, right. Those are probably not the people with the, the, you know, that, that, that's not the mentality that, that I would look for in developing a peer support team. I, and I, I actually think it's kind of uncanny whenever I go to do, you know, talks or, or work with departments. I always say, you know, there are those among you right now, and I, I call them, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a lifelong Catholic, but I, I call them the rabbis. They're the people that people naturally go to uh, when there's problems. They're, they're kind of that natural um, kind of um, leader by behavior, uh, you know, that trusted person. Exploit those people and just get them trained up to the point where they're, you know, they're certified um, really for confidentiality reasons and, and just let them go. You know, I, I actually think, you know, peer, a, a peer is just a fancy way of saying um, being a friend, uh, yeah. being a friend with some training. I think the final kind of big primary step is to, uh, is to make sure that the department or some entity is available to support whatever um, uh, more advanced needs that anyone might come up with, which is uh, counseling such as um, inpatient or outpatient treatment. There has to be some way to, to support that, that element if it comes up, and it does quite often. And, you know, for the command side, it's like, okay, if you have someone who is not coping and it's, um, you know, a culmination of extreme trauma and stress from the job, uh, how do you account for their time if they go off to a, you know, 30-day intensive treatment? Do you put them on leave? Do you make them pay for their own time? Do you, uh, you know, is there a fund that they can, maybe can help them augment their income while they're in treatment? You know, who's going to pay for the copay, which is often quite expensive. And in getting all these kind of questions uh, answered, or at least, you know, somewhat organized before you actually, you know, start executing this, this peer support team. Hey listeners, a quick but important notice for all the shows that we'll be doing for our first responders. In 2018, the number of police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and veterans, anyone who's considered a first responder who died of suicide was greater than the combined total killed in the line of duty. More attention is being paid, but help is often elusive. Even with more available resources, those who are first in line to help us, actually asking for help for themselves, that can be the hardest thing for them to do. Mental Health News Radio Network is working with Stepstone Connect to give voice to our incredible first responders. Stepstone Connect is an organization born of the belief that accessibility and confidentiality will eliminate traditional barriers to treatment. 
privacy and the peace of mind that comes with it, combined with easy everywhere access, underlines StepStone's mission and treatment philosophy. It's simple. With access to the internet and a device with a camera, you're a click away from leading mental health clinicians who specialize in the treatment of PTSD and other trauma-related injuries for first responders and their families. If you or someone you care about is struggling, please don't let another day pass before discovering what StepStone can do. Stronger connections, everywhere access, stepstoneconnect.com. You can find out more by going to their website, stepstoneconnect.com, or call 800-495-3761. Now back to the show. Nick, when you're out there and you're, you know, when you've, when you started this journey of doing the peer support work, did you, well, this is a ridiculous question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How did going on, you know, to this type of uh, an incident where you know that there's going to be some trauma, the shooting, whatever it is, how did it change how you viewed what was going on in the moment? How did it change, um, you know, as opposed to maybe uh, the, not like having the awareness. Been in an incident? No, no, no. More like you've been involved in incidents. Now you are offering, you know, peer support and you've got this awareness of, how it affects other people on the job, not just you. So you come in with, you know, looking at things, like you said, three different sides to things. I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, when you started going out, when did you have kind of that aha moment of, oh, you know, noticing things outside of you in terms of how people were going to react to your coworkers, your colleagues on the scene with you because of you having this training and, you know, bringing up that you needed peer support systems. Well, you know, and I'll be open and honest again, um, that when I first got into this peer support uh, realm, you know, I was considered, uh, you know, a ground pounder. You know, I worked mostly third watch and patrol when I was in the streets, which is the night watch and some of the worst districts in the, in the city. People were, you know, they're like, gosh, where did you get soft, Nick? I mean, <laughs> What's wrong with yeah. you? This, you know, you're turning into camp counselor, and you know, I just kind of chuckled it off, uh, you know, and uh, it's like, well, you know what, man, someone's got to do it, and I just decided uh, it didn't really bother me what people thought. Um, I, I knew it was a worthy mission, uh, it was a worthy, uh, worthwhile enterprise, and so I just forged forward. And the nice thing is, you know, that that mentality has slowly but very surely changed through the years. To where now people are actually reaching out, you know, to people like me and other trusted individuals to get help when they need it. So it, it has been sort of a, you know, a, I guess a a change in overall, you know, doctrine and and mentality about you know the fallibility of the average cop. When I was in the academy, the whole uh, one of the big part of the training regimen was uh, creating um, uh, stress inoculation. And it always mm. seemed kind of strange to me. It's like, gosh, I just was not aware that we could not be inoculated from stress. You know, <laughs> like, what we get? Do we get a shot? You know, how, do, how does that happen? Right. And it's more, you know, it's more stress processing uh, efficiently. Uh, but I also think that whole process, which keeps you alive in a firefight, also, you know, can be very destructive because it, you know, it doesn't. You're not inoculated. You're just processing it and storing it someplace. Uh, and I, you know, I feel like I'm living proof. I actually live that where after this, you know, 2004 shooting, you know, the floodgates, emotional floodgates just opened up out of control. And there's no doubt in my mind, it wasn't just from that shooting. I, I wasn't actually that bothered uh, by the shooting. It was a more of a mechanics, mechanical situation where a guy was trying to shoot me and my buddies and, you know, he lost the gun battle. It sounds harsh, but that's it truly is the reality. Um, and, um, that culmination was, was really the, you know, the, the big problem. A lot of it is that buildup of stress over time, incidents over time. So, you know, yes, the, you know, it was this incident that kind of brought things, or like you said, the straw that breaks the camel's back. But I think a lot of people, especially men, especially men that are attracted to a career as a first responder, don't, aren't trained. They are now, of course, but aren't trained to realize that, okay, all of those other stressors, have built up over time that have been bottled up and they're just coming out now. 
Yeah. So when they come out there, it's usually fast and hard, and, and it requires some sort of, um, you know, serious intervention, whether that's, uh, you know, talking about it um, with a trusted peer or friend or, you know, getting something more advanced, uh, you know, some counseling, a series of counseling sessions on up to, you know, some inpatient treatment. Because, you know, the sad tragedy is, you know, uh, the, usually the first step is, well, overtly, I'm going to make sure I have that, you know, I'm a tough cop, I'm solid, I'm good, you know, whenever I go to work or whenever I'm in the public eye. But as soon as I'm in, 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 in private and, um, you know, left with myself, I'm going to start self-medicating. Right. And, uh, you know, we all know, you know, how that most often turns out. Uh, now you've, you've got a stress problem, a coping problem, and a, an addiction or a dependency on a, on a substance to try to help you cope. So, right, exactly. Uh, and, and, you know, cops, firefighters, first responders, they, they need a place, whether they, you like it or not, they need some way to get rid of all that junk that's stored in their, their hypocampus and just waiting for the opportunity to, you know, to wreck their day. When you are, you know, working in peer support and you explain the steps to someone who's just been through a traumatic experience as a first responder, that's such an important piece when you're telling someone who's in that moment of trauma, like you said, they don't even know that a packet was handed to them, but they see it later. How, you know, explain kind of what you see when you explain to someone, okay, you might be feeling this next, and then you might be feeling this, because you know what stages people are, you know, most likely going to go through. Have you seen through the years how, as you've gotten better about doing that, and you knowing what the actual steps are, sort of seeing someone's eyes open, like, oh my gosh, thank you for giving me a map. So I can, you know, at least have a know what's coming for me or what I am experiencing. Yeah, it's more of a, I guess, kind of a triage, um, a nurturing exercise. When you've gone through extreme stress, you've been through a shooting or some kind of a tragic, you know, enormously tragic event, you, you can literally smell um, the trauma, you know, exuding from, from your buddies, you know, later on, right? right? And, and and I can I can literally you know if I, I say smell just kind of a you know metaphorical you know um, uh, way to put it but I can literally you know sense where these people are you know when I talk to them and you're right some of them will subordinate it some of them will just kind of try to bury it and uh, you know I, I I won't push on them but I'll call them a, you know a day later hey did you get some sleep last night. Uh, no, right. actually, I didn't sleep at all last night. Okay, well, it's uh, now uh, it's now 48 hours where you have not slept. And maybe give them some psychoeducation that they're not going to get out of that survival brain unless they get eight hours of, of REM sleep, that they're unable to do that themselves. Um, and, and drinking drunk sleep will not induce REM right. sleep. And go to your doctor, get something to help you, you know, get some sleep. And I, I've seen officers who have been up for, you know, five days with maybe an hour or two of, you know, call it sleep. Um, and, you know, uh, you know what happens to the brain if you haven't slept for five days. There's, there's yeah. literally no hope of your being able to cope in any way. So, so just kind of guiding them on things that, you know, I know we're going to come up. You know, you don't want to act like you're clairvoyant or, you know, put your hand on their forehead and, you know, I see you're going to be like this or, you know, right. Just kind of nurture them and, and, and go along. And, you know, there's there's plenty of, of symptoms for all the same uh, biological makeup that will come up and just, you know, kind of ask the right questions and and and, and make some, offer some, some solutions as you go along. And that seems to be the best way that I, I know how to, to help these people. Nick, you, uh, you're obviously able to steer uh, some of your colleagues towards getting help. Uh, for those that know they need help, uh, but just don't get it, refuse to, to take those steps. What do you see in your experience? What are the barriers that, that keep those people who do need help from getting help? What stops them from taking those steps? I think, um, well, there's probably a, there's probably a ton of variants, but I, I think one is pride. Um, another is necessity. You know, that whole 
uh, notion that, well, if I come forward and if anybody finds out how I'm just unable to cope on my time off, I'm going to get fired, lose my job and, you know, not be able to feed my wife and kids or whatever. And I, I think in uh, another strong element is stubbornness. You're just, you're just not willing to, you want to keep pushing, fight through and push through like you were taught in the academy. And you don't want to give up because you're afraid if you give up, then you'll never get back on track again. And and then you also have, you can't discount, you know, the realities of, of addiction. I mean, you know, someone who's addicted to any kind of poly substance, let's, let's pick on alcohol. I mean, if, if you take, if they're unable to cope and they're self medicating with, with alcohol, and then you take that medication away, then they're left with themselves and no idea how to, you know, address their inability to cope. So it almost becomes like a, um, it's like their, it's like their crutch and you're asking them, Hey, let's get you off the, the substance. And what their, their emotional brain is saying is you're, you're trying to take my crutch away, which means you're just trying to make me fall over and, and not be able to get back up. So, you know, I, I, there, there's so many different kind of directions and, you know, that's the, the beauty of human interaction. If you, if you have experienced the repetitions, you can talk with people at their level and figure out what, what, what that it actually is, right? Sometimes we're successful. Sometimes you just have to back off. And it's like, man, I don't think you're okay, but they don't feel they're not okay. So you just have to kind of wait it out, I guess, and say, well, I'm here anytime you need me. And they do come around um, quite often, actually, months later, weeks later. Um, or unfortunately, they get a DUI or they get in trouble at work or something happens at home, some event, and, and now all of a sudden they're more willing and, and open to get some help. Let's talk about the organization that you're a part of because this is part of what's, you know, getting the word out about these things. Let's talk about Code for Northwest, what it is, why you started it, and what it's about. Yeah, so Code for Northwest is an all-volunteer 501c3 organization um, out of Washington State. Our general model is to be a resource referral service for first responders and their families. Steve Redmond, who um, was the initial president, um, and I was along um, Right, right from the very beginning, we developed this program because we wanted to have a separate entity from a department for people to go to, to kind of further ensure that optic of, of confidentiality and uh, you know, discrete contact to get help that they need. And so, um, you know, the, the basic structure is we have a cadre of about 30 call takers, all current or retired first responders. Uh, they take turns having the hotline forwarded to their cell phones. They answer the phone 24-7 and uh, offer a, a, a menu, I would guess, of uh, services uh, ranging from just peer support. Uh, a lot of times calls that I've taken, you talk to somebody for an hour or listen to them for an, uh, an hour, half hour, and the common thing is, gosh, I feel better already, right, because they're engaged in conversation and and discharging some of that stress through good old fashioned, uh, you know, connection and conversation. Uh, we also go out and pre vet uh, counselors throughout the state uh, to make sure they're culturally competent, that they actually know how to, um, how to treat, recognize and treat trauma and, you know, kind of special needs of first responders. And then we do the same for uh, in and out patient treatment centers, uh, make sure that they're cop friendly. Uh, they're culturally competent and um, ethically um, committed to helping first responders without breaking their, their bank accounts. So since 2013, uh, when we started this whole thing, you know, if the business, if you call it business, because it's a 501c3, I guess it is business. Uh, the frequency of inquiries has gone from, you know, one every day or two, call every day or two, to five or seven every day. And that's just for Washington state. So I attribute that to, um, you know, you have to ask yourself. So if all these people are coming forward when they didn't before, is there some new epidemic of um, 
you know, issues and problems, or did they always exist? And and there just wasn't anything anywhere for someone to get some help. And I would argue the you know um, the latter for sure. So right. I, I think people are getting more comfortable coming forward. They're they're very comfortable in Washington State with Code Four as a, a confidential, effective resource. Um, and we're, we've really become you know the go-to organization for first responders to get help throughout the state. And I'm thinking you're setting up a template for other states to follow. We've we've had a lot of states, honestly, um, literally pulling at us to to bring it into to their state, and it's actually a conversation that that the board, uh, myself, and and some other entities are having on you know how could we effectively move to you know and expand scale out to a, a wider area. Uh, the, the primary value that, that I will not, that our board will not subordinate is the, the relevance to each individual who calls in or needs help. Um, it's, I, to me, honestly, it's absolutely meaningless to be uh, a national entity if we are not individually uh, super effective. It just, it's, it's a fool's errand as far as I, I'm concerned. So if we can, that's what we're working on is how do we scale? How do we, uh, it's, I, I believe it's going to have to turn into uh, a more of a, of a private enterprise type of model. Um, and, and so we can support the mission, you know, not a get rich, rich, uh, quick type of scheme, but a structure where we can actually have full-time administrators, full-time, you know, outreach and, and you know, helpers there at every level. I think that's the only way we could we could scale it to the national level. And we have some ideas, and um, you know those are you know it's kind of like uh, you know stay tuned. <laughs> you know, right, exactly. At eleven. <laughs> well, Nick, tell our listeners where they can find out more information. So uh, we have uh, most active, I think, is is our Facebook Code Four Northwest. Um, we also have a website Code Four NW dot org, which has our hotline number on there. And I'll say this, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably get my backside chewed by our call takers, but uh, if, if anyone is listening to this, to this program and has a, has a need or an inquiry or uh, there's anything I can do to help you, whoever's listening, get to a better place, I'm happy to do that. Whether or not, you know, that costs us, you know, extra time and effort, I, I really couldn't care less. I, I think this is a worthy effort. I'm hoping that at some point this will be available to people nationwide and it'll actually save some lives. And I want to make sure listeners, you know, it's code and the number four NW.org where you can go to find more information. And um, Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. I absolutely appreciate it. And I know our listeners do as well. Nick, do you, is there a yeah, specific number uh, as well, a hotline or a number that it is uh, an individual. Now, I was going to read that, Barry, but I wasn't oh, sure if you wanted me yeah. to. <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up, though. Do you want, Gentlemen, do you want me to read off the number? No, please do. Certainly. Okay, the number. And, and one thing, I know we're, we're closing the show, but one thing I want to make sure, so people, because people will give any reason not to call a hotline number, any reason. I understand that. But when we say first responders to call, what kinds of occupations across the board are are we saying call this number if you're in this occupation? So we're talking police, fire, and again, keep going. EMTs, EMT, EMS. Um, um, let's see, uh, corrections. Um, and when we say fire, we don't just mean structural fire, wildland firefighters. Uh, nurses, um, you know, that, that, that purview kind of keeps on expanding, um, uh, mm -hmm. it, and, you know, and, and, and trauma is not just limited to first responders for first responders is our vertical. We are, a you know, all volunteer organization with limited funding, but, uh, if, if someone's listening to this and, need, and needs help in that trauma realm, um, you know, please give a call and I'll, I'll do what I can for them. Fantastic. All right. So the number is four, two, five. 243-5092. It's confidential. 
24-7. Again, it's 425-243-5092. And Barry, Nick, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to our first responder mental health network edition on Mental Health News Radio. But never without good intentions I heat up and act on my emotions Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all, we promised we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you, I can't fight it. Good boy.